I'm from Johannesburg, South Africa, born and bred, still living here. I've had a few years overseas and bits and pieces down in Cape Town, but very much here. Second marriage, blended family, four children between us. I have always worked in corporate, did a bit of a stint in the family business, but always worked in corporate and sort of career driven. That's me in a very short summary. Awesome. So let's dive into the drinking story. When did you start drinking, Nikki? I think it's all of us drinkers, right? We all share this common trait of being a little bit rebellious. Certainly our age group started young. Yeah, I was one of those. I started with at home parties and was caught at clubs smoking and drinking by my dad. He hauled me out in his pajamas, the usual fair. But nothing that I thought was hugely untoward, nothing that gave me any cause for concern. It was just the usual teenage revelry and having a good time and what everybody else, else was doing in your parents, certainly everybody had a liquor cabinet. So that's how you could steal out the liquor cabinet. Everybody's family had one. The usual, unfortunately. Yeah. And how did it evolve as you got into your 20s and started building your career? So it had such different phases and I'm going to put them almost into decades because the longer you are with alcohol, the more the, it's like being in a relationship, it morphs at different stages of your life, you get into a different type of relationships. I think university in my early twenties was quite tame. I, I took university quite seriously. I had a serious boyfriend. You'd get only pissed at some sort of club at one night or whatever. Maybe at a bar, you'd be playing drinking games, but nothing out of the ordinary. It was nothing untoward compared to my peers. I think that that was more of a party drug drinking scene for me. I had a really good time in London, but at the same time, if I look back, the mental health fatigue that that created, the anxiety, bouts of depression, the come down midweek all fueled by substances. I didn't understand that as far as you're going up is as far as you're going to come down and you just chase the spiral. So that was really me in my 20s in London, times of desperate unhappiness. I often um, say my drinking years were a mix of chemical highs and crushing lows. And it's so much nicer when you finally nail sobriety just to be on a more even level. Emotionally. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to tell the people who are listening is that I just for this podcast, I just went to some of my blogs that I wrote and the notes and the journaling. And I had to remind myself how bad it was because now that I'm on the other side, I'm thinking this is how my fantastic life is now. It's an absolute new for what found joy. Anyway, so that was my 20s. Then in my 30s, got married. And so we had a good party for four years. And that was also <laughs> up, down, up, down, up, down. And we had what we thought was a fabulous time. Then kids, and that changes everything. The responsibility. Then my drinking was more around getting through parties, getting through the, the anxiety of having small children. And you with other adults now who are also drinking. Their kids. You give them Oros, you give yourself wine, and we just oh, you. That, that's how we roll. What I do remember is actually rolling into cars after some of these functions, and it would be mom, dad in the front after these things, and the kids in the back, and we drive home. So 10 years into that marriage, we split up. I was the primary breadwinner and managed to progress my career with all this happening. During this period, I was also diagnosed with bipolar 2. I still wonder to this day to what extent I chased the mania with drinking. It crashes you into depression. So it was a very, very dark period. And then I married a fabulous guy. I thought, okay, this is great. He thought when he met me that I was an absolute party animal and a hoot. My re career got a bit tougher. I was in a position where I was traveling a lot into Africa, quite a high-pressured consulting role. I think it really got quite habitual that coming home, you're stressed, you drink the wine, it de-stresses de you for a period of time, creates anxiety that you don't know is created. You create your own anxiety. You drink the next evening because of the anxiety that you now think is work-related, family-related, whatever. It's actually just feeding itself. 
It's very yeah. sick. Little emotional resilience or ability to manage my own emotion because you drink when you're happy, you drink when you're, you know. We don't whatever. learn, do we? The personal growth was a bit stunted. So yeah. I did that for a period of time and I got to a point where I could watch TV, be drinking wine and working on my laptop by myself. Be like a little party, my little own party by myself. My husband would go to bed. I thought, now this was the best thing ever. So that was my 40s. You're obviously drinking the expensive wine and all the dinners. And your relationship actually completely changed and evolved as you change and evolve. And you drink more. And the drink was also because of my medication that I was on for the bipolar. I was very susceptible. So I was always in this permanent headache phase, very dizzy. But you just take the anodin or the panada with the wine. <laughs> and just kept going, running in my career, running with the kids. And it. physically running, aren't, aren't you quite a yes. fit lady as well? I am, yeah. yeah. And I was keeping fit, dragging myself to gym on a Monday morning, feeling very sorry for myself, but I got there. So yes, a high state of functioning and running. When did you decide things had to change? Yes, I remember asking my husband, do I have a problem? Should I go to the AA? Because that's all you know. You must, if you, you either got a problem or you don't have a problem. That's the I first know. thing. Yeah. Either yes or no. Yeah. Then if you do have a problem, well, then you're an alcoholic and yes. you must go to the AA and you must say, well, I'm never going to drink again. And if you don't go to the meetings, then you're going to fall off the path. I did the, the tests online, am I alcoholic? It doesn't really give a yes or no. They usually ask, do you drink in the morning? Do you have days off work because of it? People like you and me were like, no, I oh, must be all right. Much. Exactly. My friends are doing exactly what I'm doing. So what's the problem? Then, yeah, so we decided we, that I didn't have a problem. Then it was one Friday morning I woke up and I'd had one in these nights where I think I dr drank probably a bottle or two by myself. And I woke up that morning, it was a Friday morning, and I felt horrible, absolutely horrible. I've never tried to moderate. I'd just seen on my Facebook feed, most probably because I was Googling on alcohol, was the one year no beer. So I hadn't done research. All I saw was an advert for this 90 day challenge. And I thought, oh, I can do 90 days. That's, that's it. I'm going to do 90 days. I had no real agenda. I don't know if I was going to prove it to myself, to the world or whatever it was, I was going to do this 90 days. And that really started the journey of self-discovery and figuring it out for myself. Did you manage the 90 days? I did. I did manage the 90 days. And then it was such a revelation. I was so proud of myself. And I started being very loud and proud very soon. It was like, I've done this 90 days. It's been fantastic. My world has changed. And then I just ran it as an ongoing experiment. So I never said never. I just continued. But through those 90 days, I figured it out. I did it properly. I read all the literature. I got into the community. I was just all over. The social media you have thing, to you know? treat it like a job, really, don't you? Yeah, was, In the beginning. Yeah. I was there 5 a.m. meditating on the website, doing my thing. I was so involved. I read every book I could get my hands on. I used to walk and walk and walk and listen to podcasts. And there's amazing resources out there now. So I just steeped myself in the AF community. I'd find my people that weren't boring. They were usually exciting people. I mean, it is a, a great community, uh, and I share your view that there's some really interesting people. Ex-drinkers are usually yes. interesting people that have really thrown themselves into life and then had a, had a bit of a wobble and now want to throw themselves into sobriety. It's yeah. where we tend to be all or nothing kind of yes. people, I think. Yes, I totally agree. That's the thing with people who were drinkers is that they are so supportive of anybody else who's even sniffing this route. People who like yourself, who've created a podcast in the community. There's people who've written books, people who egg each other on in the community. Because anybody who sees a glimpse of the other side, you yeah. just want your team members to be with you on this. Yeah, this I mean, it's, it's a revelation, isn't it? I it's think. Weird. 
So you've been alcohol free now for how long? Oh, it's almost five years. Now. Congratulations. You've talked very interestingly about the relationship with alcohol and how it evolves. And mm. I, I think you've probably seen our goodbye to alcohol letters because mm. that's very much based on the premise yeah. that alcohol is wonderful to start with. It's very seductive, very attractive, but gradually it can turn into an abusive lover for some of us. So I was very interested in how you describe that. But what about your relationship with sobriety, how has that evolved over five years? One of the things that I needed to do with one of the courses was write my why. So why am I doing this? My first why was my boys. I wanted to be present. I wanted to be available. I wanted to be stable. I wanted to be a good role model. My second was my mental health. Then just my physical health. It's been phenomenal. But if I go back to that, it's almost like I feel like I had small wishes. I go back to my whys. They almost feel Yes, small the whys evolve, don't they? Oh, they over just, the years. That's so small. Yes. Wow. Just, because we don't realize. So just with my boys, so they've had a mother that's been present, fun, available. I don't have a glass of wine in my hand all the time. I mean, they're in their late teens and I made them listen to the whole three-hour podcast from Human oh, Lab yes. on alcohol. So on the way to school, That's... they've certainly been given a view and a perspective from my husband and I that there's an alternative to mainstream. I've created such a stable foundation for them. So they're very strong people. They're just so calm in themselves. They wouldn't have that if they didn't know that they had this person in their lives. It's just that stable, consistent present. So that's been phenomenal. Then on my mental health side, I had to do the research. I had no idea that this was impacting me so badly and had been the very beginning. I read Annie Grace's book a couple of times, actually. Her explanation, which was the simplest I could find around what it, the impact is in your brain chemistry, the level of anxiety that it can cause, and it's a depressant. So that was eye-opening, and then I lived it. I could feel my mood stabilizing. So my mental health was stabilized, but with that, I uncovered who I was as a person. I discovered I'm kind, I'm calm, I'm quite introverted. I'm not the screaming banshee, because you emotionally not where you could be as a human. You don't say things, you don't address things. You just bottle it all up. Then you get drunk and you go, oh, because now it's your time. You have a right to speak. And why haven't you been speaking? And you should be speaking. You just let loose. And my husband actually was the, the brunt of that. Thank God he's a very patient and loving human. When I got sober, I went on a massive learning around how to self-coach so I, in myself, have rediscovered like what potential I have in terms of managing my own thoughts, managing my own emotions, actions, results. Life is not perfect, but I can express myself. I can say, let me prep, let me get myself together. What's my shit? What's this other person's shit? Let me just actually take on ownership of my things. Let me have the conversation. Let me be brave and actually settle it and have that conversation. Change is everything. Changes everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I understand that. that there's so yeah. many of uh, us drinkers are introverts. I was exactly the same. I would keep all this anger bottled up. And then when I'd had enough to drink, it would all come out. And I would wake up the next morning. I, I'd look at my husband's face. That was the first clue that <laughs> there'd been a problem the night before. Then he would tell me what I'd said and I'd think, oh my God, it's like you turn into a different person, this, this banshee, and it, because you've bottled it all up. But when yeah. we are alcohol free, just emotionally, we can mature a bit, can't we? We can yeah. understand that sometimes difficult conversations need to be had. We can't just push everything down. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I've given myself so much space and time. You get so much time. You must know this. Well, I had so time, time to start tribe sober. You don't look at you. I mean, 
you've got your evenings, your days, you're awake. You wake up and you're alive. You know what I mean? You can think clearly. It's like a miracle. You've got so much time. So yeah, and I was just invested in myself, I invested in the people around me. So that was on the mental health, but I'm also going to say that the learning about who I actually am and being able to step into myself. I think it's also because I'm in my fifties. Maybe it's also an age related thing that mm. I'm stepping into myself. So the, the timing is right. Then on the physical health side, obviously my gym's even taken up a notch. Now I'm rebounding because that's the latest thing, mm. jumping up and down on trampolines. Even my eating, I think changed dramatically. So I used to be happy living on wine and baked cheesecake. That would be a great meal for me. And I was like, oh, if I eat this, it works. If I eat that, it doesn't work. I'm listening to my body yeah. and, and it's rewarding me now. We talk about how sobriety helps us to connect with other people, but also to connect with ourselves with self, because yeah. we become so disconnected. We don't know yes. who we are, what we like. Yeah. I say to some people, You'll have a lot of time on your hands. What are you going to do with that precious time? What do you enjoy doing? And they say, well, I'm not sure because I spent all my free time drinking wine with my friends. I don't know what else I like. So mm. we have to embark on a voyage of discovery, really. Correct. And that's Correct. great. Yeah. And that voyage has been amazing. I now have breakfast with my girlfriends. That's my new thing. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm full into my pottery. I do puzzle while I'm watching TV in the evening. That relaxes me. Mm -hmm. I'm hiking. I take my boys hiking. We cycle around Joburg on graffiti tours. We, I take them to the Berg on weekends and make them march up and down the high peaks. We just went to Sri Lanka, myself and my husband for three weeks, and it was just awesome. It was awesome not drinking. Yeah. There were all these tourists and they congregated around some of the bars and the drinking areas. And you're like, oh my God. Thank goodness. We don't oh, have I, to do that anymore. No, exactly. Holidays are fantastic. And you come home feeling refreshed rather than yes. feeling exhausted. Yeah. So, I mean, all these like things that I had no clue and my career, oh my gosh. So suddenly I've got time, I've got mm -hmm. energy, I'm clear yeah. thinking. And the big ticket, which is like an unknown win, is that you teach yourself that you can do this incredible thing yeah. and you learn to trust yourself. You go down this road thinking, this is how life is. I've got a belief system. Alcohol is in the world. I drink like everybody else. And that's just the way the world works. It's just the way the world works. Then you ch choose something else and your whole belief system changes. You learn yep. all this new information. You experiment on yourself. You learn a whole way new a way of being. And you suddenly think, but what else could I do? If I can do that. Yeah. If I can do that, I it can gives do you so much confidence. Uh, I don't know if you've um, seen our website recently, but we've got sobriety as a superpower all over it because there is this feeling that I can do that really yeah. hard thing. What other hard things can yeah, I do? That's exactly it. So I've just stepped up. Instead of keeping myself small, when you're drinking, you're keeping yourself small. That's what you're doing. So yeah. Now that I'm not doing that, it's like, oh, well, hang on. You can take on more responsibility. You can do this. So, well, of course I can. No problem. Mm -hmm. I trust myself. I wake yeah. up every morning here headed with energy, ready to take on the day. Yeah. There's, of course I could do that. Yeah, because uh, I think even if alcohol doesn't destroy us, it will always prevent us from reaching our potential. Yeah. Let's see. So... Yeah, it's just been, it's been a phenomenal, and I wish I had a before and after picture of what's happening internally. I wish I had a picture of the chaos that was happening mm -hmm. inside and now the internal calm and confidence that I've got now, it would yeah. be an, like an incredible picture if I had the before and after, and you can't see that. To begin with, sobriety is obviously it's great. You feel better. You look better. But there's more down the road, isn't there? Mm. That's what I would like people to understand. For me, that was like this second stage that I wasn't expecting at all. You get all the extra energy. I mean, this mm. surge of energy, because in my case, when I hit 60, I felt exhausted and I thought, oh, well, this is what it's like to be old. And now I'm much older than 60 and I'm absolutely full of beans. And I swear it's because I stopped drinking. 
So there's really a deeper stage than those superficial benefits. And it, it's a feeling of joy, I think, as yeah. well. Not all the time, but now and again, you get real surges of energy and joy. And that's why it breaks my heart when I meet people that have been sober for about six months and they haven't really done the work and they, they've just gone back to it mm. and they've said, oh, well, it's, it was a bit boring. I decided mm. to for drinking because I just want people yeah. to hang in there a bit longer and, of course, do the work. Because if you don't do the work, then you're almost coming at it from a place of deprivation. You need to do the research exactly like you did in the beginning and then it all falls into place why we shouldn't be drinking <laughs> toxic poison that's it janet i think you, that's it you've got to do the work you've actually got to put in the time and energy to investing in yourself yeah because big alcohol has been educating us for our whole lives telling us how wonderful this stuff is so we've got to reverse that now haven't we we've got to take that all apart and build a new belief system as you called it Talking of beliefs, you, you read Annie's book, and I just wondered what your limiting beliefs used to be around alcohol. Do you remember how she says we have to surface those limiting beliefs and yeah. then overturn them? Well, I think one was that I'm going to drink for the rest of my life. Like, I didn't even question that, ever. No, no. So that was like a belief I had that hmm. I, like everybody else that I know, yeah. Is going to drink till you die because that's what mm. you do. That's the first belief. I think another one was that you need to have alcohol to have fun. Yeah. And that's, that's a, a big that's one, standard isn't it? one. And I'm certainly having fun now. It's maybe a different type of fun. I'm mm. not hanging on to a bar counter repeating myself until 2 a.m. Maybe I'm <laughs> not having that. I'm getting louder and louder in my octaves. So maybe not that, but the fun that I'm having now is a completely different type of fun and it's loads of fun. I also thought that I was going to lose all my friends. I still got a concert and have a great time. Mm. Now and again, I go to a small club around the corner and I'll dance on a Saturday night from 8.30 to 10.30, just dance my head off and then come home having drunk some water and it's great, got to sleep. So I have that, but I don't do the long brides that start at like one and then they go on and then they eat at five. And then who's about to fall over by that stage. When I first arrived in South Africa, I, I learned that routine to my cost. I was completely <laughs> smashed after about two hours. Exactly. No sign of food anywhere. See, I don't get invited to those things anyway because I don't want yeah. to be there. What are they going to do with me? So you kind of shift yourself and get shifted out of that. The limiting belief is what I'm capable of. I think I had no idea what I'm capable yeah. of. I love the way you say it keeps us small. We've yes. just, I say to people, you've got no idea how your life will evolve mm -hmm. if you carry mm -hmm. on down this route, because we yeah. can't see that in early yeah. sobriety. We can't see a, how much easier it's going to get and b how our life might change dramatically. Yeah. That's but been even, such you know, a joy for me, seeing other people evolve in very special ways. Yeah. But even that evolution, it's not like, oh, I did my 90 days and then I had an ecstatic life for the next five years. No. That's, that's not been it at all. You're just more um, in touch with what I'm you more need in to touch. do and, and I help. And... doubted it along the way. So you get those you, moments. Yeah. yeah, you get those moments. I've had two blips. It's like an experiment. Hmm. And in that, most probably around 250 days in, I think, uh, anxious from work, came home, and I said to my husband, let's just open a bottle of red. So I had a glass of red wine. Immediately, I got a headache. He got bad sinus. Yes. But the first 20 minutes, we thought, oh, my God, why well, did we ever give what were you we missing? Why did we ever think that giving up alcohol was a good idea? This is amazing. We are going to do this every night. The red wine's back. It's fantastic. After 20 minutes, it's like, maybe not. You know what I mean? Um, 
But what it did teach me is that once you've broken that seal, I know myself, I wanted another glass. I could have opened up another bottle. If you can see this thing slipping so fast. Oh, so that was an eye opener for me. It was like, oh, wait, hang on. I'm just going to go right back. So I had to go back and just remind myself my whys. Then there was another one where some drama blew out. And I went to a friend and I said, okay, this is it. By that stage, I didn't like the taste of the wine. She had had expensive wine. I didn't like the red. I didn't like the white. I had those two experiences in amongst mm -hmm. this where I taught myself something. I've tested through my own experimentation what it means to have a glass of wine. Yep. And I know now that it wasn't good for me. But in these last year, Janet, there's only the time that I've got to where it's like I don't see it anymore. Mm. You know, maybe you're allergic to avocado. Yeah. In actual fact, your eye on the shelves, when people are eating it, when it's around mm. you, you just don't see it. You don't see the adverts for avocado. And it's taken that long oh. because you've been on this other track for years and years. It's taken that long for it actually not to feature. Yeah. I don't know if it took that long for you. Probably, yes. For me, one of the joys was when I started to see through the marketing because I watch Netflix and those beautiful ladies with their huge glass of red and then they go into court and annihilate the other side because they're a top lawyer the next day and Perfect. you're thinking, oh, that, lo that all looks great subconsciously. And now I, I play a game. I watch a movie and I think, okay, how long till the real star comes out? The real star being alcohol. And it's usually less than five minutes. Yeah. If there's a macho hero, it'll be the scotch. If there's a lady, it's probably red wine, sometimes white, but, or sometimes a cocktail. But it, it's everywhere. But, but it's lost its power. I just laugh now. And this obviously doesn't trigger me to drink. It just triggers me to say, oh, those buggers, they're still at yes. it. Still yes. pouring trillions into yeah. making us all want to drink. I loved what you said about your family, how you feel that they're having a different kind of upbringing. Because I can't tell you how many uh, women that I talk to and they say, well, as I was growing up, alcohol was everywhere. It was just normal. It was just a nightly ritual again and again. So children see that and they think, oh, well, that's how... People have fun. And also when they see mom drinking because she's all wound up about something, they think maybe that's how I cope with problems. And this yeah. is all subliminal, but they'll pick that up. I think to grow up in a household where alcohol isn't prevalent is wonderful. So Nikki, if someone's listening to this, they know that they should stop drinking, but they just feel a bit overwhelmed and they don't know how to start. Because that first step is the hardest, isn't it? What do you think they should do? Yeah, so for me, it's a lot of reading or listening. Listening to podcasts like this, get a hold of Tribe Sober, just get onto listening to whatever podcasts work for you. I'd also get into the books, either read or audio the books. So educate yourself. I think that's yeah. the message. Then I would also get into the community side. It added so much value. Just yeah. hearing other people's successes, where they're struggling. And the fact that I could participate and help other people, even if it was a high five yeah. or a heart or whatever, that I've read you, I've seen you. Yeah. Yeah. And to have that done for me, I just found hugely empowering. And I know that Tribe Sober does that quite strongly. There's a, a strong community feel and it's not massive. It's not like a massive organization where you've got mm. thousands. So I think it's nice that it's personal. I've been to quite a few of the breakfasts that you've held. So just figuring out that I could go to some breakfasts mm. and meet people that had got different stories and sharing books to read around being alcohol free. Oh, it's just such a lovely social. So it's that sort of thing. Get yourself immersed. If it's online, in person, whatever it may be, yeah. get, get immersed, um, get educated. Another one is to replace, replace, replace. So the alcohol free drinks, I had them when I home. I had them ready. I did more exercise. I did more walking. I walked podcasts, walked podcasts. I got into hobbies that I'd forgotten about. You just get busy because you need to do that to stop the unraveling in your brain. 
I'd also say writing down your whys because you need to keep coming back to those and remembering. Yeah. I'm alcohol free. I'm so friggin' happy. I'm alcohol free and I've got no desire to be drinking and, and mess with that at all. Besides which I don't have a desire to drink. I don't have a desire to drink the alcohol. I don't have a desire to get drunk. So it's gone. 